Okay, so thank you to those who are on the call. Welcome to this webinar about the Masters of Digital Product Management program. This is a brand new program, the first of its kind in Canada, one that we're incredibly excited about and very excited to talk to you all today about specifically. This program is developed and launched in partnership between the Smith School of Business and the Queen's School of Computing. Start with the land acknowledgement. We just want to acknowledge the fact that Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. As a university, we are very well grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. An overview of our presentation today and kind of the topics that we'll be touching on, we wanted to start with just a definition of digital product and digital product management, and really kind of roll that into defining the opportunity that digital products has for organizations across various industries and sectors. And then a natural extension of that is just identifying the opportunity that the program, the MDPM program, poses and offers to prospective students and candidates and looking to leverage these skills across industries and sectors. Um, as I mentioned at the onset of this presentation, the program is developed and launched in partnership between the Smith School of Business and Queen School of Computing. Um, it's a true partnership program, so we want to kind of talk to that in a little bit more detail because it's one of the most exciting elements about the program itself. And then, of course, we'll get into some of the nuts and bolts, some of the specifics of the program so that you can all put yourself in the shoes of our prospective students, really kind of understand what the experience will be for that inaugural intake of the program, which will happen in September of this year. So September is rapidly approaching and we're currently recruiting for that first class that will begin in September of 2022. If by the end of the presentation, you think that you might be interested in moving forward with an application, as we hope that at least some of you will, uh, we'll provide a quick overview of the application process and kind of what those next application steps consist of. And then we'll make sure to leave at least 10 or 15 minutes at the end here for a dedicated Q&A session. We'll make sure to get to all of your questions. A couple of matters of housekeeping for today. Anyone who registered for this webinar will receive a video recording of it after the fact. So if you're on the call with us now and you're not able to stay right through to the very end, have no fear as you will receive a video recording of this event in your inboxes, if not later today, then at some point tomorrow. As far as the Q&A is concerned, there is a dedicated Q&A function directly within the Zoom call here. So please type in your questions as they come to your head over the duration of the presentation. If we're not able to quickly address them while we are presenting, then we'll make sure to create a, a nice backlog and a nice queue of those questions to take through in turn at the end of the presentation. So please don't hesitate to type in your questions. So I'm very lucky to be joined here today by my colleagues, Valerie Hoover and Dr. Catherine Broman. Catherine is an Associate Professor and Distinguished Faculty Fellow of Digital Technology here at Smith School of Business. She's really been dreaming about and thinking about this master's program for the better part of 10 years now. So that she's incredibly excited that it's kind of finally come to fruition after 10 years and we're so close uh, to the launch. So we're really ha happy to have her as the guiding light for the program and, and one of its main kind of driving forces over the last 10 years. Uh, we're also joined by Valerie Hoover, who is the program manager. So Valerie is kind of the go-to point of contact for students right from when they enroll into the program, preparing for the program launch. And then, of course, she's there to guide students throughout the entire academic delivery of the program when it does start in this September. Um, so Val has lots of interaction with students over the, over the course of that work. That leaves myself. My name is uh, Connor McCann, and I'm the associate director for this new MDPM program. I'm basically responsible for a lot of the external stakeholders. I, I manage the entire application pipeline and there have been a number of very engaged and talented and qualified applicants who I'm working with on a daily basis. So that's uh, always something very motivating to get me out of bed in the morning. And I also just make sure that the program is well tapped in to industry. Obviously, this is a professional master's program. So we're trying to train digital, digital product managers from a practitioner in a practical sense and standpoint. So we just need to ensure that uh, the, the skills that we're providing to our students can be immediately leveraged and applied to industry. So that's part of the work that I do as well. So this is the team as, as we'll be joining the presentation today. Um, so let's get the ball rolling here and I'll pass the virtual baton over to Catherine who will define digital product and then kind of talk about the opportunity that provides as well. Sure, thanks Connor. And thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, how I wanna start is just uh, really laying out the landscape. And, I, and if you're on this call and you're thinking about digital product, there's, there's a, uh, an assumption in the industry, I think, that you know, brings us to these wearables and kind of the Amazon Echoes of the world to think about digital products as things that organizations are building that they want to sell. And certainly that is part of digital product. The other part, though, is that the idea that every organization, so we see here as Caterpillar, you know, taking their existing products and actually you know, putting, building new capabilities into them through software enhancements. And so you think about what a tractor, a smart tractor might look like and all the capabilities that are enabled through, you know, 
putting these sensors and different devices and software applications on a tractor. But then even more exciting is the whole idea of what's happening internally. So if you think about COVID and how we, we went to remote work and all of us went to remote learning and all these new opportunities to leverage digital as a way to really change the way we do our job. And, and um, so many opportunities are coming out of that space. Salesforce is a great example of that, just enabling the workforce to do their job easier, empowering them with data, empowering them with different capabilities. So the whole point is that digital products are everywhere. It doesn't really matter what industry you're in, you know, what job you have, chances are there's going to be digital change either happening now or near in your future. And I think that a lot of people are wondering you know, how this digital product uh, wave is going to impact them and their job. And so it really is a very vast landscape. And to Connor's point, the people that we're seeing coming in are coming from everywhere. And so it's exciting to start to see this really starting to take shape. So moving on to what the opportunity is, it really does depend on you. Right. So if you're thinking about, I want to come to this program because I want to invent the next mind blowing product, you know, that definitely is an opportunity. You know, certainly you can, you have a passion and you're really trying to drive something and you, and you want to um, create an opportunity within your own business to, to drive a new way of doing something or, or develop something new that that is definitely an opportunity. But so is the idea of disruption. So if you're working with an existing organization, especially an incumbent firm, Many leaders today are just starting to think about the digital opportunities. And so maybe that's your interest, right? You're saying, I'm sitting in a traditional industry. I'm, I want to help that business really understand how to move because you don't want them to be disrupted by these Ubers and Amazons and wealth symbols of the world. And so it's, it's perhaps that you want to be on the disrupting side or you actually want to be on the incumbent side. But that's another huge opportunity is to help your organization either succeed or help one of these you know, uh, disruptors achieve their goals. And then finally, when you think about how it influences value, for us as customers, everything is changing. Think about how we consume media, how we watch TV, how we, how we you know, en entertain ourselves. It's all changing how we process a claim you know, through an insurance company. Everything's changing. And so not only is that changing for us as customers, but it's also changing in us as employees, right? The way we do our work and micro learning and the gig economy and all these kind of things that are happening. So really the opportunity is, is again, across the industries, but really dependent on what you're interested in um, and what your passion is. So what is digital product management? These next few slides I've actually put embedded in quotes from different people. So this is Jessica Creases. She's on our, she's the head of our advisory board. And so, you know, looking at what she's doing at Cineplex Digital Media really helps us understand what digital product management is. And it's both a role. So definitely, if you want to join, you want to say, I want to become a digital product manager, then, then this is a great program for you. But it could also be that you just want to become a, more, a better consultant, or you want to become a better analyst, or you want to become a better vice president within an organization and lead your organization towards digitalizing their capabilities. And so it's both a role and a function. And, and it serves itself within the organization truly at the heart of the business and the technology organizations. And so what Jessica is saying here is that product managers have to think strategically about business for sure, but they also have to hold that technical credibility on details around engineering and development teams. And it's a really important point. So one of the big offerings of this program is it's no code, low code, which means you don't actually have to code in, in the program. We actually don't teach coding. We teach technology in the way that we're trying to make technology accessible to people. And so digital product managers usually have a development team that they manage, they code. You just have to be comfortable with, again, the, the details around what these engineering decisions look like or development teams, what their capabilities are. But investing in these, um, these skill set, really one of the big things that we need to cover is the idea that you have to lead cross-functional. And so it really all is about people movement and, and, you know, and really understanding how to influence the right people across the organization. And that's where it really becomes important to identify different leadership skills, different communication skills um, to enable you to do this job effectively. 
So just a bit of a reality check. Many people think, you know, we've been doing technology projects forever and, you know, isn't this something that we understand how to do? And sadly, the answer to that is no. In fact, when we look at, you know, 78% of these digitalization efforts are failing, the whole question is why. So the person here, Nick Graham, he's the academic co-lead for the School of Computing for the program. And he's been absolutely instrumental in terms of thinking about really what it is that people don't understand because they've been teaching technology development forever. We in the business school are teaching technology development forever. So what are the, the, the gaps within those different skill sets that are missing? And so when you look at digital products, someone needs to provide leadership on the design and how it fits within the organization, but they need to advocate for the product within the senior management team. And different than projects, you can never let it go. So many digital product managers will hold like a profit and loss responsibility, or they're managing a continuous line of business, as opposed to really kind of managing a project and then letting that project go into the business for them to run it. They also need to be uh, able to lead tech, you know, issues around the best technology and how to make the product secure and compatible with the existing infrastructure and architecture that exists within the organization. And then of course, make it easy to use. And all of those things are easy to say, much more difficult to actually do. So the golden age of product management is what people are calling that's going on today, right? 29% growth year over year in these product management job opportunities. We're seeing rise of leaders within the organization. We're seeing VP of product, you know, chief product officers. They're starting to enter into the C-suites. We're also seeing the, um, the average pay increase. So as, as in anything, as the demand gets higher the, the, and the supply is, is uh, still standing still in a lot of cases, um, we're starting to see the pay rates go up. There's a lot more value for these people within the organization. And another interesting thing about this is the first program of its kind. So many product managers are actually self-trained, right? There are some great programs in the industry around like the Association of Product Management. They will provide you with these certifications. But when you actually embed academic rigor into these skill sets to really understand what does critical thinking look like? What does problem solving really look like? How do we lead effect, you know, effectively across functions? How do we leverage what we know about architecture integration and security, but really understand it at a deeper, deeper level and try to get really the idea of critical thinking skills developed, not just the skills to be able to do it, but to really understand what you're doing. And so Tolu here um, was actually a student of ours in, uh, in the full-time MBA when I launched sort of the initial part of this in our full-time MBA. And he says here, in, in our economy, it's important to have people who understand the market, understand user behavior, and understand the way value is created for business owners, for customers, and ultimately society as a whole. And what's so neat about that is just the relationship between digital product and sustainability. And the whole idea that all of us want organizations to get better, all of us want to treat the planet better, and is there ways and opportunities that we can think bigger about these digital products and the impact they might not even have on organizations, but people and our planet? And so all these become a reality um, once we get this digital product management skill set more developed. So the partnership is probably the biggest and most exciting part of this program, right? We are in true partnership with the School of Computing. And, you know, I always joke because Nick and I once had a, an hour conversation about the word solution and how it meant something different to me than it meant to him. And this is the stuff we are unpacking, right? So we are truly integrating content, which is different than other academic programs that have two schools at the table, but they kind of just teach what they teach. We are actually coming together and we're building what we call a connective tissue. Right, a real true understanding between the two faculties. And the challenge, one of the challenges with digital product is that its skill sets lie across different academic silos. And so there's no way that we could ever offer this without them at the table. And so it's a true partnership that we're excited about. So the last thing before I turn over to Val is just a description of the program. And as Connor said, you know, this has been in my mind for a long time. I actually started a program about 25 years ago at the University of Georgia. That I was the Masters of Internet Technology. It was all the beginning of this wave of these creative new products. And we tried to divine, just design the program in a way that we would make it really accessible to people that were actually working in this space. So it's a 12-month program that you do while you work. And Val will talk more about this. The biggest thing that we, I want to recognize here is just this whole idea of the connective tissue. So when we actually bring these two schools together, we're unleashing a, a whole new set of 
uh, knowledge and knowledge and skills that is truly leading the industry in this space. Now, the one of the interesting things about building this leadership team that you see here is that doing that, you know, moving across silos, as you can appreciate, you have to do that as a product manager too. But I'm having to do that as the director of this program, specifically moving across the School of Business to the School of Computing. And that's why we have Val Hoover. So Valerie has been with the school for, you know, 25 years. She's way over, um, over skilled for her job for me as the program manager. And the reason why we got her was simply because she's going to be the one that's going to help us pull these um, pull these two competencies together. So I'm thrilled that she's here today, and she's going to tell you a bit more about the program. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Catherine. I'm uh, excited to be here too, and to be a part of this uh, inaugural program. It's uh, it's exciting, and uh, I'm glad to kind of uh, talk about it to everybody who is on the call right now. So. Uh, the next few slides, I'm going to sort of talk about these various topics, the program structure, um, the connections that uh, that we can make, the student experience, and uh, we're going to touch on the Career Advancement Center as well. So as you can see, the program structure, um, as Catherine noted, uh, noted, it's a 12-month program uh, with three streams that blend thought leadership with practical application. Uh, as she mentioned, no code, low code development. You can take this program while you continue to work. So we have structured it in such a way that, um, that you can take your classes and uh, maintain your full-time job um, at the same time. And there is a fusion of technical product management and leadership skills. So the program itself, we are going to have a soft launch uh, the week of September 19th, uh, which we will have, um, we'll have a, a short introduction and then we'll have some self-paced uh, learning uh, before we come into the first residential session um, here on campus and at Queens. Uh, the overall structure of the program itself will be one or two evenings per week, plus Saturday mornings on designated weekends. And the thought is, is that if you don't actually happen to have a session, um, a classroom session on one of those nights, then we encourage teamwork on any other times that this, this time is blocked off so that you can work on projects or, or just collaborate um, on the program itself. Uh, it can be taken remotely from anywhere across the Americas. And as noted, we are going to officially kick off the program with a one a mandatory one week residential session uh, in Kingston on Queens campus. And that'll happen um, that week of the, of the 19th. Um, and then ongoing coaching and advising um, and network and career support will uh, be available to, to everybody throughout the program. So this program is a team-based learning model, which most of our uh, master's level programs are. Uh, each, each team will have about five to six students in the team and they will keep that team throughout the program. We, in order to support the team, we have dedicated professional team coaches. And for the project course, we have industry-based project advisors to also assist. So there was always going to be support um, in this team-based format. During the residential session, there'll be high-performance team training to sort of give you the tools and resources that you need to be successful in working with the team. Um, and we will work, the program team will work with the coaching team to ensure that we have uh, the teams that we create uh, will be diverse and with lots of knowledge across industries so that we have a fully functioning team working well together throughout the program. So as noted, we have three, uh, we have three streams of program courses. I'm, as you can see, there's a lot of courses. I'm not gonna list them all, but we've got our knowledge stream and our application stream and our experiential learning stream. Um, these, it looks like a lot of stuff going on. It is, it's very busy, but they are, um, they are really going to be just short sprints of courses. So a lot of content, um, but it's all like, as, as Catherine mentioned, between the two schools, a lot of integration, a lot of working together, the faculty ensuring that what's being delivered in each stream um, meshes cohesively with the business and the technology piece. So the faculty and industry connections that we have, as noted with the partnership, we have outstanding faculty from both schools that will be helping to deliver the content of the program. Uh, also, we have faculty, adjunct faculty from industry. So we have leaders in the industry who have real world knowledge and expertise. And uh, we also have an advisory board to ensure that there's a high quality and re relevant curriculum and to ensure that the learning outcomes for each course is being adhered to. 
Um, we also have industry network, uh, which includes alumni and product management roles, and they will work with teams throughout the year to provide feedback to the faculty and to the program teams to identify opportunities for program um, level improvements as we move forward and into um, another our next intake. The student experience itself. Um, so we have the, as mentioned, we have the in-person residential session that happens in September, which is a one week mandatory session, brings the whole class together. So everybody who's enrolled in the session will be together for that one week. Um, at the end of that week, we uh, send everybody off to their home cities to go back to their work, go back to their family. And then from there you learn via virtual platform. So video conferencing, Zoom, and we'll have other um, platforms as well to help you collaborate and continue to work together as a team, even though you're not in the same room. Uh, we've had lots of experience with this, not only with COVID, but previous to COVID, because we've, we've had these um, video conferencing programs that have been running at Smith for a long time. So we have a pretty good knowledge on how to run that. Um, and in addition, it'll support your experiential learning for the project course. And just to give you a little bit more uh, detail on the one week residential session in Kingston, as noted, it is mandatory, so everybody will need to come to Kingston. The arrival for this session is on Friday, September 23rd, so everybody will sort of start to arrive on that day that we have program registration in the afternoon, and then we're going to launch with a program welcome in that evening. And then classes will take place from uh, the 24th through to October 1st, with departures happening on the afternoon of October 1st. All the accommodations will be at the Donald Gordon Conference Center here on West Campus, at, and classes will also be taken at the Donald Gordon Center and at Woods Hall, which is actually the home to um, Smith School of Business. So it's exciting that we're going to have be able to have them uh, right in the building here. Um, so throughout the week, there'll be a combination of team building, uh, learning exercises, academic content workshops. We're going to plan some social events. Um, and introduce you to our Fit to Lead program, which is a health and wellness program, which will provide you with tools and resources to help you maintain a healthy work-life balance while you take the program. And I'll turn it back over to Connor. Thank you, Val. So I just wanted to take a few moments here to mention the MDPM advisory board in a little bit more detail. As we mentioned, we're going to use this board to really inform the curriculum and just ensure that we're providing all of our students with very topical, relevant skills that they can apply immediately to industry. Um, taking a look at the board membership as it is currently composed, you'll see that there is great cross-sectorial representation from the consulting sector, the public sector, right through to big tech and private industry. Um, I think that the multifaceted nature of this board is really indicative and almost a microcosm of digital product management in general and how you can apply these skills to so many different industries and sectors and companies. Uh, another note on the board is that we're hoping to add another five or six members to add even more diversity, even more cross-sectorial experience. Um, so expect this board to, to evolve and, and get to uh, an even more um, you know, multifaceted place within the next uh, coming months or so. So please uh, keep an eye out for that. So Val touched on this previously. Uh, Smith has decades of experience with delivering virtual synchronous classes. Um, we do have a production studio that's located in the basement of our business building here in Kingston. We've been leveraging to deliver these types of lectures from, since the 90s. So, so years of experience even before the pandemic. So we can still deliver very immersive and engaging academic experiences from afar. Um, as a special feature of the MDPM program over and above just our regular virtual delivery will be this virtual learning platform that is really being built out by our colleagues over at the Queen School of Computing. Um, this is effectively going to be a stack of digital tools that students can use to collaborate and really leverage digital technologies right from whiteboarding to prototyping to implementation. So it's a, it's a whole stack of tools that students will get to use and interact and play with over the duration of the program and something that we think will really add a lot to the experience and something that, that we can do obviously in a remote and virtual capacity as well. So when it comes to the experiential learning aspect of the program, Val, again, alluded to this previously, but because this is a master's application-based program, we think it's very important to put a big emphasis on the application of the academic material. So it's not just about memorizing models and frameworks and theories and then closing the textbooks at the end of the day. We really need to make sure that we're taking these concepts and applying them to solve real-world business problems because that's where the most enriching learning happens at a graduate school level. And I think probably the best example and kind of the culmination of the experiential learning aspect of this program will be in that nine month practicum 
whereby teams of between five and six MDPM students will be paired with a real world business client. And over the duration of that nine month practicum, they'll deliver real value to that client. So it's just a great opportunity to apply what you're learning, really get your, your feet wet and your hands dirty and playing around and tinkering with some of these digital technologies to drive change and to drive value for an organization. Final piece that I want to touch on here is just the career support that we offer to all MDPM students. There really is an entire constellation of career support and resources that are available to all Smith students and certainly those who are taking in the Masters of Digital Product Management program. This is the framework that we've kind of built out when it comes to career support over years and years of experience at helping students kind of pivot their careers or navigate their careers in general. It really starts with discovery, you know, discerning for yourself your strengths potentially where your weaknesses lie and also what you're hoping to accomplish in, in your career. And once you have that guiding light or that North Star, then it's about building your profile and really putting in the work to put yourself in a position to execute on what your dream is. And once you've put in that work and you're finished with the building stage, then it's about launching. It's about execution, going through the interview process for whatever job you're interested in, having mock interviews with your career coaches. And we do provide those services in-house here. And then once you've secured a job, there is often some haggling that takes place after the fact, just negotiating a salary. We help students with that as well. So it truly is a full suite service, right from self-discovery through to career launch. And it's very important to know that all the services that we offer through our Career Advancement Center here in Smith can also be delivered very easily in a remote capacity to our students. So MDPM students can take full unfettered advantage of these services over the entire duration of the program. And they're also available to alumni of the program. So you'll have effectively have these career services in your back pocket over the entire duration of your career, which is an incredible value add and just something that can really help you um, make a pivot in your career, whether it's over the duration of the program, five years from now, 10 years from now, you always have access to those resources and access to the Smith network. So at this point, we hope we've convinced some of you to, to move forward with an application and just know that if you are interested in moving forward with an application, you will be paired with a dedicated application advisor who will be there to guide you throughout the entire process. As Faith would have it, I'm currently the application advisor for the MDPM program. So anyone who decides to move forward with an application will work with me. And I'm, I'm currently working with a very strong pipeline of applicants on, on a daily basis. There's been a lot of interest in the program, which has been phenomenal. Um, if you're at a point where you're still trying to gather information and you're not 100% sure as to whether or not you want to throw your hat in the ring with a formal application, we can always proceed with the preliminary assessment. So all you need to do is provide your resume and unofficial transcript. I can take a look at those documents, get a sense for your candidacy, and then that can really just start a good conversation. We can have a dialogue as to your fit for the program, whether now is the best time. You know, if you don't qualify for the program now, I can give some feedback as to maybe steps that you could take in the short term to put yourself in a better position to qualify for a future intake of the program. If we, after that dialogue, we decide that we wanna move forward for the current recruitment cycle of the program, then you just need to provide a couple application elements. I'll be there to provide feedback and guidance throughout that process. And then we'll go ahead and schedule you for an interview with myself and Catherine Broman. Sometimes we're joined by Valerie Hoover on the interviews as well. We like to kind of tackle everything as a team. We're a tight knit team. So we're really happy to have Val join in some of those interviews. And then because we operate under a rolling admissions model, we generally provide applicants with their admissions decisions within a week to 10 days of their interview. So it's a fairly quick turnaround. It's a very flexible process on our end. When it comes to deadlines, and this is a question that we receive um, quite frequently, because of that rolling admissions model, there are no hard application deadlines for any applicant to worry about. Um, but one thing worth keeping in mind when it comes to just the timing of all of this is that we're currently recruiting for a first class and we're targeting a relatively small class of 40 students for a first intake. We think that it's incredibly important to provide each and every student with the attention that they require to get the most out of their academic experience. And that's especially important for the inaugural intake of a program. So we would expect, and just kind of based on early indicators and the, the interest that we've received in the program so far, that demand is gonna outweigh supply and that we're gonna have more interest in the program than we have seats to allocate. So just the piece of advice that I would give to any applicant at any point would just be to start the process early, um, doing so, at least having a dialogue with myself to see if there's alignment and completing your application earlier rather than later will ultimately put yourself in the best position to secure one of those limited 40 seats in the program. So that's just a word of caution there. Finally, we have the fees for the program, both domestic and international. Please note that these fees are inclusive, so they do include access to all tuition, books, learning materials, the virtual learning platform, that stack of virtual technologies that the School of Computing is putting together, that is all included um, into, the, into the tuition fees, as are the meals and the accommodations during that week-long residential session that Val detailed for everyone. So the only real material cost, the only to factor in over and above 
fees, tuition fees would be your transportation to and from Kingston for that one week residential session. Depending on where you're located, that might be a flight, it might be a train, or maybe just to take a gas if you're located in the GTA or not too, too far away. So that concludes the, the presentation. Again, we really appreciate everyone taking the time to, to hear us out about the new Master of Digital Product Management Program. And we'll transition now into a couple of questions that we have in the queue here. Sure, I can go, Connor, because we'll just give Connor time to, to um, catch his breath because I've got my eye on the first question here. Yeah, I was drinking coffee. So the, the first question in the, in the, um, in the uh, Q&A is, does any component of the program touch on project management or qualified for PMI, PDUs? Thank you. So that, that is a great question. And um, so there's a whole uh, entire six units, what we call six units, which equates to about 56 hours of contact uh, with regard to managing a digital product experience lifecycle. That in itself gives you what you would need for, for sure, if you don't have a PMP and you would wanna get your PMP designation, there's 35 contact hours that you need for that. This program would grant those to you. I'd have to do some homework with regard to the 60 PDUs. So if you have a PMP and you need the 60 PDUs to recertify, there's different categories of PDUs, and I expect that I'll be able to find parts in the program to build a 60 PDU um, offering. Um, and so I would say if this is your question and you're really interested in the program, this is something that we can unpack, um, you know, either when you're in or even before. I'm happy to do that. I just have to check. There's one category of PDUs that I'm not sure that, I, that I'll qualify for, and it's about 15 of them. Um, but I think I should be able to get them. I just have to get a little bit creative. Do you want me to take the next question too, Connor? Yeah, sure, go ahead, Captain. Sure, okay. So the next question is, will any support be provided for career opportunities in the DPM program after completing the program? Specifically, are there any companies affiliated to this program? The answer to that is no. Uh, we won't affiliate ourselves. It's just the way that we work here at Queens. We, we try not to, we have lots of corporate partners and we don't show preference to any specific partner. Um, that being said, we have representation on the board. We have a tactical advisory board that works as actually your industry um, advisors for these projects that you would run. So there's a nine month practicum in the program and you get assigned a, a, an industry advisor and that industry advisor is connected to a company. So I would say there's lots of opportunity to, um, to connect with different companies, but there's no specific company affiliated with the program. And the next question here just pertains to the COVID-19 situation. If it gets kind of any better, do we intend on having more in-person sessions as opposed to just the one week-long session at the start of the program? Um, you know, looking forward five or six years, we might develop the program to a point where there are more planned residential sessions. Uh, but something that we've been thinking about is just getting a sense for where our students are clustered. And if there's, you know, a cluster of 10, 11, 12 students located in any city, then certainly we'd like to reach out and, and perhaps in, engage with those students and create some social events for them based on their location. So more to come on that. We just need to get a sense for where our students are going to be physically located. But I know that there certainly is an appetite from our team to work with students, regardless of where they are located, to, to kind of build out and maybe plan some more in-person elements of the program in their respective cities, wherever that may be. And then another question here, just about the delivery of the program. Can this program be taken virtually while working, while working full-time? Absolutely, this is an earn and learn program. It's designed to be taken in conjunction with the full-time career. So you can take this program from anywhere kind of in the Americas uh, while you continue to work full-time. The only exception to that would be the week-long residential session that takes place towards the end of September. So you need accommodations from your um, employer to take time away from work to participate in that week-long residential session. But over and above that, the entire um, balance of the program and all the academic material can be taken in a virtual capacity. So thank you for that question. I can take the next one, Connor. Um, so, so this is a great question around, is the requirement for having successfully completed at least one introductory or entry level equivalent of an undergraduate course in business? And this person said that we have a, a non-business background that UX design in a university program. I would argue there's got to be something in there. If you've taken a UX design course, like program, there's got to be something in there around, you know, strategy or something that we can work with. Um, but definitely those are the sort of things that you can work with Connor. Connor can bring that to me if it's a special ask. The other thing that you can do, which, which you know, I do, there's so many introductory business courses in, on these different online offerings. 
And so if it would make you feel more comfortable just to sign up for one of those, you know, a lot of them are free, but it's just going to give you that intro to business kind of, you know, what are the four P's of marketing, you know, these sort of basics that are just in and around an introductory business course. But to answer that question, I would say it doesn't have to come from a business faculty, right? There's uh, lots of people that teach business that are not on a business faculty. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's not consumed. And that's the same with the computing course, right? The computing course if you don't have an introductory course in computing, you don't need like, you know, like a computer science 101 course. You could just, you could take like an information systems course in a business school. So these are just a check that you have some foundational understanding of business and some foundational understanding of computational thinking. Thanks for that, Catherine. The next question here might be a good one for Val. The question is, is the nine month practicum on top of the 12 months of learning? I can take this one. Thanks, Connor. Um, it's, it is not on top of, it's included in the, uh, the 12 months of learning. Uh, there will be specific milestones along the way that you'll have to, that you'll need. So it'll actually be introduced um, in the residential session. We'll have a couple of, uh, couple of sessions to sort of kick it off and, and get you rolling. So it's going to be, um, it's going to be constantly kind of going right through the program as well. So you don't have to do anything on top of the 12 month uh, duration of the program. Thank you for that, Val. That's great. This next question here, Catherine, is pretty substantive, so I might uh, give this one to you. Since the program is the first of its kind in Canada and potentially even in North America, how do we know that this course will deliver real value to its students? So there are some um, benchmarks I'm using out of Europe, and so I was just digging those, but the University of Barcelona has a program. There's another school in Spain that has a program. There is some evidence in um, that actually I use. So all the external evaluators of this program came from Europe. Um, so those are the benchmarks that I've been using and they, they you can go on and see value. Um, I'll post some of these in typed answer uh, once I stop talking here, but I, I, you know, to be fair, that's really where we built the value prop was coming out of Europe. Um, the other thing I would say that gives me, you know, uh, real um, validation around the content and the thought knowledge in this program is the changing of the pin box. So if you're familiar with the Project Management Institute, they, they've just changed their project management book of knowledge to be very wrapped around the product management experience and, and those competency sets. And they have validated that this is the skill set to move forward with regard to managing change within an organization and what that looks like. And so I think there's some validation in that, that they've changed their competency set you know, so that that suggests in itself that within North America, there's a real need and opportunity for value creation uh, by following a different, less of a project model and more of a product management approach. But as I uh, move on to the next q and I'll dig out the, um, the schools and put them here in the uh, answers. Great. Another question here, what type of candidates are you looking to accept into this program? Is there an emphasis on undergraduate grades? Um, I would say that we always like to apply a holistic approach when evaluating candidates for admission into the program. So while, you know, undergraduate GPA, and if you've already completed a master's degree, the GPA that you received in your master's degree does give us one data point to look at. Um, it's really just one piece of a much larger puzzle. Um, we're trying to discern someone's ability to work effectively with others in a professional capacity, their receptiveness to constructive feedback, because students receive lots of coaching and lots of feedback over the duration of the program. You know, one's professional background and also the progression that they've had in their career is important as well. So, you know, while undergraduate GPA is certainly one metric that we look at, it's really just one of a series of metrics that kind of goes into that, that decision. So, you know, one piece won't make or break an application one way or the other because we do kind of apply that, that holistic approach. Um, when it comes to the types of candidates, I mean, one of my favorite aspects about this program is that how it's, we, it's a pretty, we cast a pretty big net. Um, there aren't a lot of very specific prerequisites or requirements that students require an undergraduate degree from any recognized university uh, really around the world, as well as two years of post undergraduate work experience. Those are kind of the two hard requirements that, that we ask for. Obviously, we'll have a lot of students who come from pure play technology backgrounds and pure play um, business backgrounds. But uh, we had a, an applicant earlier today who came from a woman study background and her case for candidacy was, was very compelling. So I think it's just really interesting how this program will draw from a lot of different academic backgrounds and a lot of professional experiences. And that composition and having a very diverse class in that respect really just add to the academic experience for everyone. So I appreciate that question. Next one here, will the practicum groups be influenced by student location and 
will we be provided with opportunities to work in person on deliverables? Mm. So I think this speaks well to Connor's earlier point. Like we don't know what we're going to get until we get it. And I think we have our executive MBA programs run, run, runs in that model. So we have, you know, the major cities represented in our executive MBA program and they have localized boardrooms. And I think if we did have a, a, a cohort that was represented in Calgary or in, you know, San Francisco or in Vancouver or Toronto, I think that it's a good, it's a good thing that we would definitely consider, you know, could we create more localized um, engagement and the opportunity to work physically? We do have a, um, a, a Smith school in downtown Toronto. Some of our other programs run out of there. And so if you're in Toronto, that's probably very doable in terms of having a localized team. Um, and then we do have boardrooms in all the major cities uh, because of the executive MBA program. So, so I like that as a model. Um, and, and certainly it's in my mindset with regard to as we scale the program beyond the initial 40 students, I would love to have localized experiences in all the big cities if we can. Um, but that I also don't want to discourage people that are coming in from non, you know, like smaller cities, because I think once we go blended, it takes away the digital, like the, the real online opportunity, learning opportunity. And so I just want to be really careful in how I manage that. Great. So it looks like I can combine answers to the next two questions into a single response. They're both about financing options and scholarship. So I'm glad that this question was raised. Anyone who completes an application for the program is automatically considered for a merit-based entrance scholarship. So just by virtue of completing an application, you will automatically be considered for scholarship. The strengths that we're looking for in applications when it comes to making that scholarship decision is the exact same when it comes to the admissions decision. Well-rounded candidates, combination of work experience, undergraduate GPA, you know, your willingness to work effectively with others, your coachability, how you, you know, conduct yourself in the interview and the cover letter and all the elements that you provide, strength of your references. So all of those facets are implemented into both our admissions decisions and our scholarship decisions. There's no separate application process for our category of merit-based entrance scholarships. And when we make an admission decision, we make our scholarship decision in conjunction with that. So we can always provide applicants with their scholarship decision along with their offers of admission if they are admitted so they have the full financial picture and they can discern whether or not um, it's, it's financially feasible for them to take the program. Over and above that, the Smith School of Business really uh, recently launched two new categories of scholarship. We have scholarships for Black students and scholarships for Indigenous students. So once students who are in either of those groups are admitted into the program, they can provide us with a supplementary essay, and we're happy to provide the parameters for that essay. And then uh, by the end of May, and then we'll have a, a review of those essays in June and then allocate um, some of those, those Black and Indigenous scholarships in June as well. So they're kind of those two categories of scholarships to keep in mind. When it comes to financing, um, the Smith School of Business has a formal business relationship in place with RBC, whereby RBC is very well versed on the programs that we have to offer here at Smith. And we can certainly connect our pr prospective students with representatives from RBC who are a bit of experts when it comes to the programs that we offer and the, the products that RBC offers that can help students kind of bridge the gap and then finance their studies as well. So there are many resources available there also. So I think that just about covers the questions here now. If anyone had any additional questions, please don't hesitate to type them into the chat. Um, when you, we do follow up from this webinar, we'll provide a link to the recording, as we mentioned. I'll also have um, Ryan Horbay, who is our tech support here today, and big shouts out to Ryan for helping us with this, uh, to provide everyone with my email address that so they can contact me directly. We can always have a, a conversation about your candidacy for the program or schedule a Zoom call. Um, so there are many ways to engage. Uh, please keep an eye out for other webinars and other virtual events that we will have between now and when the program launches in September. We still have uh, a, lot, a lot of marketing to do and a lot of educating to do of the marketplace with such a brand new space and such a brand new program. But it looks like those are all the questions for today. So we'll give you a bit of time back. Again, we just wanted to thank everyone for taking the time to join us here today. We hope that you're as excited about the digital product management space and this new program as we are. And uh, goodbye for now. Thank you. <laughs>